Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us tonight. Got a couple announcements for things coming up. Start with, uh, please mark your calendars for June 17th. That's going to be the third Friday in June. We're hoping to be in person for that. And our featured speaker is going to be Dr. Ted Karamansky. And the topic for that night is going to be the somewhat of the history, but mostly the future of the Chicago Harbor Light. Um, it's not in the best of condition and its future is a little uncertain. So we're gonna to try to bring in all the stakeholders and everyone who really cares about its future here in Chicago and have a great program just focused on that. So I hope uh, many of you be able to come and join us at the museum on June 17th. Those of you who are members, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. If anybody is interested in joining, you can just go to the website and you can click on the link to join. If you're not a member, uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could make a small donation. If you could make a $5 donation for being here tonight, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to have everybody involved in some way, uh, but uh, whatever you can do, that's fine. We appreciate it. So I will go ahead and introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, tonight, we're very pleased to have Russ Green. He's a maritime archaeologist and Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for NOAA's Office of the National Marine Sanctuaries. Russ has worked in the Great Lakes for 20 years, first as an underwater archaeologist for the state of Wisconsin, and later as Deputy Superintendent at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. He's contributed to dozens of maritime archaeology projects along the east and west coast and also in Bermuda, Micronesia, and Japan, and regularly leads NOAA field research in the Great Lakes. Russ is currently leading a startup of efforts for the new Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast National Marine Sanctuary, which we're in here a lot about tonight. So please join me in welcoming Russ Green. Thanks a lot, Jim and Jerry. I really appreciate it. Thanks for an opportunity to share with you guys a little bit about the, the new marine sanctuary here in, uh, in Wisconsin. Talk a little bit about the history of the sanctuary, like how we got where we are, um, a little bit of the, the history of the, the shipwrecks and it's just broad significance. And then talk about some projects we've got going on uh, right now. Uh, we were just designated in August of 2021. And as I kind of chat here. I'm going to share my screen. And, you know, for a long time during the designation process, in fact, I, I was down in Chicago to talk to this group um, a few years ago, you know, and it was always, this is what we could do. This is what the sanctuary might be. And I had to show all these images of, you know, other marine sanctuaries. So it's pretty cool to be able to talk to you about the newest marine sanctuary in the system. This is the 15th National Marine Sanctuary in, in the National Marine Sanctuary System. So hopefully you're seeing a title slide here. If not, you know, Jerry or Jim shout out, but I'm gonna just kind of plow forward. One of the things I thought I'd kind of circle around as a theme for this talk is, is collaboration. It's what makes everything run for every organization. It's really important to the sanctuary and it happens on different scales and in different ways. And it really is kind of an engine to make the sanctuary uh, work and have really great impact. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, the first kind of collaboration that's important to note is that the sanctuary is, is part of a larger National Marine Sanctuary system, uh, 15 marine sanctuaries across the U.S. and, you know, protecting iconic natural and cultural resources. So it's a pretty eclectic bunch of sites. But there's program-wide programs, you know, education, research, conservation. So there's a number of sort of high level resources that the program has that we can draw to Wisconsin. You know, that's kind of really important for a sanctuary, particularly when we're getting off the ground um, and we're building up capacity. So being able to funnel that expertise here. So if you're an educator and you're in the sanctuary area and you're really interested in how the sanctuary might enhance your curriculum or a collaboration we might have together right now, out of the box, you know, we've got kind of century-wide resources to get those collaborations started. You know, the other one is just being part of NOAA, science, stewardship, and service. You know, those are the key elements of NOAA. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's a big part of what we do is kind of funnel those resources and expertise and programs into the sanctuary. So just having this box carved out in Wisconsin is really a place that we can direct NOAA resources and other resources. So that collaboration is um, is pretty important to our success getting off the ground. There's 
One existing, well, there's two existing National Marine Sanctuaries now in the Great Lakes. Uh, the one in the middle, of course, is the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. That was designated in 2000. Our sanctuary here in Wisconsin was designated just last summer. And there's another sanctuary that's being proposed in, in Lake Ontario. For this group, I usually use this slide for two reasons. One, to say that, you know, having this increased awareness on the maritime heritage of the Great Lakes is good for anyone that has an interest or an organization that's focused on culture and heritage in the Great Lakes. So, you know, these are footprints that help us reach out to Congress, to help funnel focus from the public and others. So, you know, all boats rise on, on the tide. So these three sanctuaries are focused on heritage resources, you know, primarily shipwrecks, but other resources as well. And the second reason I use this slide is geography lesson, uh, which you all know very well, which is the, you know, the Great Lakes are a water highway, and that's why the cities, big and small, have grown into what they are today due to their proximity to water. And there's probably not a better example than Chicago is, as you all know. But, you know, for people that aren't familiar with the Great Lakes, and there's some that, you know, don't know where Wisconsin is and are shocked to find out that there are shipwrecks here, it's a U.S. history lesson. I mean, this is an economic engine for the United States today as it was two centuries ago. And so it's important. And, you know, one of the things that shipwrecks are is they're sort of tangible pieces of history that people can attach to and then kind of explore deeper and broader patents of history. And, I, and I'll talk about that, but the Great Lakes Water Highway, that's that's kind of a key thing, as you know, for all of us. And the sanctuary itself, you know, this is interesting and also very collaborative that the sanctuary began with an idea that came from the communities along the lake shore here. There's, there's four of them for folks that know the lake shore. It's two rivers in Manitowoc, uh, Sheboygan and Port Washington principally, and the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, they got together and uh, wrote up a nomination for this to be proposed as a national marine sanctuary. It was the first sanctuary actually to be done this way. Typically, or the sanctuaries prior were a little bit top down. There wasn't really a, a grassroots way to get a sanctuary off the ground. So Wisconsin was the first one to do that. And, and in this proposal, the communities, they've got to talk about the national significance, which is well documented here, but then also this broader vision of why they think a marine sanctuary would be a good fit. And the cool thing about sanctuaries is our resource protection, you know, our idea of resource protection includes community engagement and education and research and regulations. And so it's kind of a broad package. And the, the communities saw that, you know, links to tourism and recreation, for example. So, you know, you can read the, the little uh, snippet from the nomination, but that really gets at the broad vision that these communities saw. So, you know, that was 2014. There was um, a pretty robust public process. We worked directly with the state of Wisconsin, several state agencies that you can see in the, the top there. And so it, it's a collaborative approach to creating a national marine sanctuary. And along the way, we made boundary changes to the sanctuary based on public comments. So pretty robust public process. And it's really cool. I, I think it's really cool because it sets the stage for how the sanctuary is managed going forward and, and who its you know initial partners are state partners all the way through for the existence of the sanctuary. You know, these communities in the state of Wisconsin were co-managed with the state of Wisconsin. So really key to um, have that as part of the designation process. Well, the whole thing got wrapped up last summer and uh, in August, and this is the final boundary. It's uh, 962 square miles. There's 36 known shipwrecks in there, you know, maybe another 60 to be discovered. Right now, there's actually 27 on the National Register of Historic Places. So the idea that this is the story of westward expansion for the United States is, is pretty richly told in the shipwrecks here. And that's a big part of those National Register nominations. In October, we had a, uh, a media event. You know, we wanted to do something a little bit bigger, but, you know, COVID just, you know, pandemic did what it did. So we focused this event on uh, a media event with some you know, key partners and Senator Baldwin and Governor Evers, Rick Spinrad, who's the head of NOAA, mayors and other state agencies and, and other folks came up to Manitowoc to the Maritime Museum there and, and kind of kicked this thing off. And I mentioned that because that too was collaborative and it was pretty cool to hear mayors from different communities talking about one goal, which is to tie this entire region together and, and tell its story, make those 
tourism and recreation connections, but really begin to look collectively at this place as, as a region. And those were echoed by the senator and the governor as well. So again, this thing about sanctuaries is, you know, you draw a map and you have a purpose and you have a mission and a lot of different organizations can coalesce around that. You know, we're really thinking about this as a, as a region. That's our job. And the communities look at it too as a region and also what the sanctuary might be able to bring to those individual communities. So that was a, a neat event. And, and again, a, a nice way to kick off more collaboration. This idea of like national exposure from a national marine sanctuary, that's, that's one of the things that kind of comes with the sanctuary. We got to work hard at promoting this place and getting the media's attention. Um, the designation announcement, you know, that resulted in, you know, the news stories you can see here. I hope you can read this and the number of media impressions. And that's, you know, basically the, the number of opportunities somebody had to, to see those stories. So Chicago Tribune is a great example. We had an article there years ago and, the, you know, the Sunday subscriber, I think that's about 800,000 subscribers to the Sunday edition. And so, you know, if you get it, we, I think we had a front page story there during the designation process. And so pretty good. That's, you know, potentially 800,000 people to get a chance to see your story. And again, it's not just a story of a federal marine sanctuary. It's a story of a region. It's a story of the communities and the states and the history and the heritage and the potential for this place. So media coverage is important to us and the communities. There's two good ones. If you're looking for just a quick hitting, easy to digest piece on the sanctuary, there's one on NPR. It's on NPR Here Now, and if you Google Here Now, Marine Sanctuary, you'll find it. And it's, uh, it's a really great partner who then worked uh, at the Neville Museum in Green Bay, but is a Wisconsin archaeologist, and, you know, talking about his perspective on why the sanctuary is important. And then there's another piece on Great Lakes Now, which I'm sure you guys all know. It's a video piece, and so you can kind of check that out. It also talks about some map we're doing, and I'll talk about that as well. From a historical perspective, it's kind of neatly tied up between the 1830s and the 1930s, at least in a historical context that we think about history as. We recognize the sanctuary waters are ancient, and for millennia, people have used these waters for subsistence and travel, communication. You know, that's a story that we want to tell, but it's not always our story to tell. And so we're working now with tribal communities to see what potential there is for collaboration to, to tell those stories that predate the first shipwreck. You know, we get fixated on, on shipwrecks because they're the most visible, they're the biggest, most complicated artifacts sitting on the lake bed. And and as you all know, there's as many as maybe 5,000 across all the Great Lakes. But the history of the sanctuary and its culture extends for thousands of years. And I know you recognize that in, in Chicago waters, but that's a big part of it. And so that's a, a piece we really want to be part and parcel with the way people think about the sanctuary. But from a historic standpoint, you know, 1830s, this is the wreck of the galley nipper off of Sheboygan. It's in about 200 feet of water. And so this is early coastal trading, beginning to bring those furs eastward and really connect Wisconsin frontier with the rest of the United States. So a really important shipwreck and one of the oldest in Wisconsin. To 1929, this is the steamer Senator, which sank off of Port Washington, about 20 miles uh, east of Port Washington with a couple hundred Nash automobiles that were leaving Wisconsin for other ports. And so, you know, you've got this early frontier period, you know, Wisconsin isn't even a state to this industrial period and industry moving that material throughout the Great Lakes, which of course is, is something that you guys are familiar with. And everything in between, you know, canal schooners, barges, and, and et cetera. So there's a pretty well-documented story here through the lens of shipwrecks in, in the marine sanctuary. But, you know, roughly 1830 to 1930. It's a little funny talking to this group because you probably hear this a lot, but I think it's key for folks that may not be too familiar with this, that, you know, shipwrecks, we think of them often as a moment in time. It's the shipwreck. It's those hours or a day of the event of the shipwreck. And that certainly is a pretty important milestone on that ship's particular journey. But there's something else that shipwrecks do, and they connect us to this much wider universe of maritime history uh, that is, you know, largely gone now. I, I guess I'm just kind of thinking off the cuff here, but you know, like lighthouses and shipwrecks, you know, that seem to be the dominant cultural features that dot the landscape. And of course, you know, shipwrecks are hard for the average person to kind of imagine and see and to certainly go visit. They're important and they connect us to this world. That lower right hand image is the Manitowoc River in 1890. And 
you know, you see these steamers and, you know, people just having a good time and skating. And I have to wonder, are they looking at these things like the technological marvels that they were? You know, this is a big part of shipwrecks and archaeology is a lens and a pathway into engineering innovation that really drove America through the 19th century. So I, you know, I wonder, it'd be great to go back and talk to one of these folks and is it like seeing an airplane, you know, kind of docked outside your window? But certainly shipwrecks tie us to these places. They tie us to every community, big and small. This is Sheboygan. You get the gist. The river's choked with schooners, scenes that are long gone, but are still, you know, have left an indelible impression. The culture of Sheboygan, the economy for a long period is, is so tied to uh, Lake Michigan, the Great Lakes. It's a big part of the culture here. And within the sanctuary, you know, the, the wrecks represent this bigger, broader Great Lakes travel and commerce and industry. This is a a glimpse of the steamer Niagara, which sank a little bit north of Port Washington. And, you know, built in the 1840s, it was a palace steamer of the first order, one of the biggest, if not the biggest on the Great Lakes when it was built. And, you know, its owner, Charles Reed, if you landed in New York as an immigrant and you were in the port of New York, he had agents there to get you to Buffalo, where Niagara would make its, uh, you know, 14 or 16 runs a year between Buffalo and Chicago, stopping at places like Sheboygan or Collingwood, Ontario, or Milwaukee. And so this was a ship that brought immigrants to Wisconsin. I think on a good year, maybe something like 4,000 passengers might travel Niagara and come to Milwaukee and then go on to Chicago. And it sank in the 1850s with the loss of, you know, maybe 60 lives. One of the really, I think, key things or important things that is kind of untapped is the number of artifacts that come from these shipwrecks. This one in particular, and I'll come back to this in another couple of slides, it's almost like shipwreck 2.0. You know, when you think of all the artifacts that are out there in private collections that came up in the 70s or even the 80s, when diving was an adventure, who wouldn't love that adventure? These are some artifacts from the Niagara that were recently donated to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. And you, you can see a, a bell, you know, the Niagara caught fire. So you see the fire damage there, ice skates, a pistol. These are the pieces of material culture that tell us about the people, the times and travel. And they tell us about U.S. history as the Niagara is making its way from Buffalo to Chicago, connecting the Midwest with, you know, the rest of the country and, and the world. So there are a lot of artifacts out there, as, as you all know, and I think this is, an, uh, this is an area where we really could work together with other cultural entities and even private folks who've had this thing kind of sitting in their garage or maybe it's been passed on to the next generation. And, uh, you know, what do we do with these? And, you know, can we conserve them? Can we um, display them creatively to create a tourism buzz? And certainly can we protect them for future generations? So uh, really some untapped potential there with the volume of artifacts. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll talk about that in just a second. In a slide that nobody here needs uh, an explanation of, but if, if you're not from Chicago, I usually use this one to say that you know shipwrecks in the sanctuary also link us with with Chicago and the, and the greater Great Lakes. But of course, you know the 1840s Chicago and Milwaukee, the greatest great exchange in the world. What by the 19 or 1870s, Chicago is the biggest lumber market in the world. So it's growing because people are moving to the Midwest and they're you know, growing wheat, the breadbasket of America, and it's got to get out by a water. And it's also able to be built quickly because of its proximity to water and the ability to get lumber and other building materials there. I mean, that's the broad brushstrokes, but you know, it's one of the world's great cities and sort of one of the, world, one of the uh, Great Lakes key cities um, because of its proximity to water. And that's something that you know, when you're outside the Great Lakes, you know, it's kind of sometimes a revelation to, to understand that. And the amount of history that was funneled into Chicago um, via water, it's key. I mean, really, Great Lakes history is maritime history. I don't, I don't think there's uh, a, a separate, you know, great, you know, maritime history and the other history of the Great Lakes. It's just, it's all tied together. And one quick shipwreck story here that actually links us to Chicago here in the sanctuary, and that's the Ras Simmons which you all know very well, but I'd like to use it to just point a, a couple of milestones along the way of the journey of the Ralph Simmons. And in one sense, the journey of the Ralph Simmons is continuing. And I'll talk about what I, what I mean by that. The center figure is uh, Chicago. Uh, you guys know this image, I'm sure very well. Uh, Herman Schunemann, you know, second generation German immigrant, 
grows up and born in Algoma, which was then Anapee, Wisconsin. I mean, kind of the, the end of the end of the world. And he eventually makes his way to Chicago and he owns a saloon. He's in the grocery business, he goes bankrupt at one point and eventually is uh, finding himself on schooners, driving schooners, later owning a share and then, you know, captaining schooners. And he's in the Christmas tree trade, which needs no explanation here. But again, it's it's one of those um, interesting and kind of key elements to uh, the history of the sanctuary and and Chicago, this this trade alone. But Herman and his brother Augustus are are big figures in this trade, running um, a, a good number of the trips every November to come down and bring Christmas trees to Chicago. There's some debate whether the plaque to the Ralph Simmons, because it would tie up at the Clark Street Bridge, is is still there. Somebody can go look for it, or maybe they know and they can kind of let us know. Um, but you know that wreck is um, is is pretty important up here. Doing that work in November, of course, was dangerous. And Herman Schuneman lost his brother in the 1890s during a Christmas tree voyage, bringing those trees into Chicago and not too far off the coast of Chicago. That ship foundered, and uh, Herman Schuneman lost lost his brother. So Herman Schuneman was no stranger to the dangers of the Great Lakes. 1912, you know, the ship is coming back from the UP, loaded with Christmas trees. By this time, Herman Schuneman is a fixture on the Chicago waterfront, and he's expected to be there. He's a, you know, kind of a cultural and I guess maybe to some degree an economic icon on the, on the river. The ship disappears north of Two Rivers. It's um, sighted by a couple of life-saving stations, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, its crew and perhaps the um, the team of woodchoppers from the Great Lakes are are lost. You know, they're lost lost to time. All kinds of speculation about what could have happened. Herman Schuneman's daughters and wife carry on the business. They're bringing a couple of schooner loads down and eventually using rail cars and I think doing this into the 1930s. And so there's a lot to be said about this particular story, but I mean, the point about using it here is that there's a lot of this we may not know if it wasn't for the shipwreck itself. That shipwreck was found in the 1970s. And so it kind of begins the second part of the voyage of the Ralph Simmons and is something that we can use to, as a lens into that history and to explore that history. Uh, and this is its own adventure story. Kent Bell Richard finds this wreck and the early 1970s. Um, he's out there in October, I think, when he finds it, and he does a solo dive. You know, so for those of you that are divers, you know, the, the Ralph Simmons is in about 150 feet of water. It's just always cold at 150 feet, right? It's high 30s, low 40s, and he's doing this, you know, before zebra mussels and quagga mussels, so there's not great visibility, and he's and he's doing a solo dive, and eventually sorts out that he's got the got the Ralph Simmons. So an incredible adventure story. And I would argue is a key part of the history of the Ralph Simmons. So these folks that are out there looking for these ships, finding these ships, they're part of the history of, of this place, of, of the marine sanctuary. You know, flash forward a couple, you know, I guess into the early 2000s and the Wisconsin Historical Society, which has got a fantastic maritime archaeology team, is doing some archaeology out there and they're trying to sort out the historical record with the archaeological record you know, doing these dives in 150 feet of water and, and sorting things out. So there's this archaeology and the history that's making this, um, this shipwreck live on. And today, you know, it's still, come, you know, the uh, Coast Guard cutter Mackinac still visits the Chicago waterfront. And just to return back to the kind of ongoing story of the Ralph Simmons, there was a, a wreck hunter up this way out of Port Washington. His name was Butch Klopp. And he did a lot of diving in, in what is now the sanctuary. It just happened to be sort of close to his, his own port. And so he did a lot of work at the Ralph Simmons and recovered a, a lot of artifacts. Many are at the Roger Street Fishing Village in Two Rivers. If you've never been there, it's a great place. Uh, check it out. But this donation is, is you know, may end up in a, in a museum up this way, you know, where the uh, Wisconsin Maritime Museum is uh, has the collection, is kind of assessing it, working with the family, and just trying to figure out what's next. So that aside, you know, what Butch Klopp did here, recovering probably a couple thousand artifacts from the Ralph Simmons is, you know, essentially excavated. Um, and if the Ralph Simmons, for whatever reason, was left untouched until today, as you all know, it would be difficult to do because of the quagged muscles uh, that now, you know, cover the wreck. So, you know, these things are recovered and, and there's a huge opportunity here to bring these from a private collection into the public space, do something really creative here. You know, can we, 
you know, again, thinking outside of the box, you know, are, are, is there enough here that we could, you know, start a conservation lab, really dedicated to the conservation of Great Lakes artifacts and make it a, a tourism uh, venue, put these artifacts on display, invisible storage, you know, that behind the scenes feel you get when you see visible artifact storage in a museum. There's a lot to be done here in the Wisconsin Maritime Museum and, and other institutions on the lakeshore are working away at it. So we're we're excited about maybe being part of, of this um, this this next phase of the Ralph Simmons journey and other shipwrecks in the sanctuary. And you know, as you know, the cold fresh water, you know, this is it. This is the the secret sauce for why we're able to do all the things we do uh, centered around shipwrecks, our, our whole community of folks that are interested in maritime history, maritime heritage. This is a sample of some of the wrecks in the sanctuary. And I, you know, I show them here because they're in different environments. There's deep ones for tech divers. There's stuff kind of in the middle. There's stuff for beginning divers uh, off of Raleigh Point. There's several that you can paddle out to and, and snorkel. So moving from the history into sort of where we are today and how do you continue to leverage these places um, recreation certainly is, is a key one in getting people to come out and, and, and visit these places, particularly those that are you know, close to shore and you can spend an afternoon kind of paddleboarding out there and, and looking at a few shipwrecks off, off Raleigh Point. These are images from Thunder Bay, but something we'll do in Wisconsin this year is install mooring buoys at some of these shipwreck sites to you know, give boaters a, a solid place to tie up to, have a nice safe ascent and descent line for divers, but also eliminate the need to grapple a wreck and, and create damage that way. So we'll get started, you know, we'll get a few in the water this year and then eventually build out these products that go with them, you know, the, the dive slates and, and a website so that you really can promote this region as an interesting place to come and adventure, but then you have a mooring buoy that makes it that much easier to go visit these places. And so, you know, this is important for the sanctuary to do this work. This is resource protection. But you sure could see, you know, a dive charter operator or, you know, a paddleboard renter um, using these products to promote their business. And that's that's a big part of, of why we do this stuff. This is all publicly accessible. So, um, you know, helping to um, support businesses in that way, recreation businesses. And hopefully you're seeing a, a quick video here. Also in June, we'll do about a 10 day project to shoot um, virtual reality videos. At, at as many shipwrecks as we can get to. Um, this is or this is a Lake Ontario wreck called the St. Peter. Um, this is us doing that a, a few years ago. So again, talking about those NOAA resources that are available, you know, we can bring those folks in, put them up, give them some food. Um, I'm a diver, so I can jump in there with this VR camera. It's like crazy simple. It's the only thing that they'll actually hand me to do. Um, and you can swim around the wreck, and if you cover enough of the wreck, you know, then you can create these virtual reality tours for the headsets um, to be viewed online, et cetera. Individ users can navigate all over the shipwreck site. So, you know, we want to produce as many of those as we can. Um, and then 3D modeling as well. That'll be a big part of that project. But the idea is to create the stable of products that are useful to anyone that has a, a business to promote or wants to promote the area as the shipwreck coast and certainly museum exhibits. Um, there's tons of potential for these for these products. So we got to get in there, we got to get them done. We got to put them together and make them available. So we'll, we'll do that, start doing that this summer. Uh, we'll also get in the water uh, three real-time weather buoys that we um, wrote a grant for last year. And um, these are really cool. If, you, if you're if you not familiar with these, they're they're made by uh, a company called So Far Ocean, and they're little, they're, they call this model spotter buoys, but they're essentially little uh, wind and wave detectors, uh, wave height and direction, wind speed and direction. Um, and previously, there were no real-time observations in this neck of, of Lake Michigan. In fact, for the boaters out there, you know, you, you've got the big buoy at the northern end of the lake and the, the one at the southern end of the lake, and that's what you check before you head out there. So it's good to have some local um, real-time uh, um, data that boaters and divers and others can use, surfers can use to see what's going on in the lake. So um, we're happy to get, we're thrilled to get these back in the water. They were in, we got them in late last year. Uh, they were in for about 50 days, and we had 40,000 individual um, or um, collective website visits, and we had 7,000 unique visits. And so, you know, we know that there 
popular. We know that it's there's uh, a need to be filled there to, to have this kind of information uh, for recreators. And uh, we've also put temperature uh, sensors on these and the fishermen, the commercial and the, the charter fishermen particularly really like this because you know the fish go where the right temperature is. And so they're able to get a snapshot of that. So um, these have been pretty, pretty popular. We'll also continue to, to map the sanctuary. And this is really key to characterize it both culturally and uh, environmentally, the natural uh, features of the Great Lakes. So this is again where we can direct some of those NOAA resources to, to the sanctuary. And we're working away at it. This is a snippet off of Sheboygan. Um, and so this is this is done by the Office of Coast Survey, you know, updating the charts, but also getting this great up-to-date high-resolution sonar data. There's a couple other pieces of the sonar uh, that are really important here. There's something called backscatter, which measures the intensity of the turn. And so you can actually start to figure out what the bottom type is all about. You got to go back out and ground truth it to make sure you, you know what you're talking about. But there's a NOAA program that, that does this. And we started a pilot project with them. This is online. This is all public accessible. And the idea is to create habitat maps. So if we are going to run a, a really great sonar uh, around the sanctuary to update the charts uh, and to produce and to figure out what's going on culturally, well, what if we could use this data also create great habitat maps for the sanctuary and maybe have a whole new way of thinking about this area of Lake Michigan and uh, start to ask some new research questions. So this is a really key thing we want to do. This is something we're going to have to go, you know, beat the bushes to find the resources to get this done. But there's no outfits that that do this. And so we're, we're pretty thrilled about the potential to, to map the sanctuary, but also create a, a habitat map, which is useful to lots more folks than just uh, archaeologists. And I'll just kind of wrap up with a project we did last year that kind of hits these collaborative points as well. This was a, a grant that we wrote through... Um, NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. It's a great grant if you're not familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, just about anybody can apply. So it's a good way to get some dough to do some work. Um, you gotta have an angle, you know, you gotta have a hook and technology is a big theme of, of this grant. And so we propose to use autonomous platforms to look for shipwrecks um, in this really sandy, shallow area of the sanctuary that there's several known shipwrecks, but there are many yet to be found and it's it's really dynamic it's shallow all these ships came aground so it's kind of a ship trap and we we did this in collaboration with a few partners and i'll and i'll talk about who those are uh we had a team from university of miami bring up this this huge drone with this six foot wingspan uh and then we had a private company marine magnetics who was trying out some new gear and they have a, a magnetometer a big fancy metal detector and you know they're working on new software new technology and they said hey can we just you know can we attach access to the drone. Do you guys want to use this? And we said, absolutely. So, you know, they get some R&D, the sanctuary gets some data. These graduate students from University of Miami uh, get some stick time behind the drone. And this turns out to be a really effective way to find uh, buried materials that are, that are metal, that are ferrous metal. One of the things about an autonomous platform is you just program it and it runs, you know, the tightest line spacing that you want it to do. And for those of you who have mowed the lawn with the sonar, you know, you know the deal, you're kind of drifting off lines and you're trying to stay straight. Well, this drone can do way better than we can do it um, just kind of running the joystick. So this is a really, a really good way to do it. We were pretty happy with the way this turned out. The second piece of three uh, was an autonomous surface vehicle, which had a sonar mounted to it. And the idea is to just let this one kind of run and mow the lawn with a sonar, paint the lake bottom with sound. And this one can run for as long as five days. We, we couldn't do that here, uh, but this company runs these in the ocean where they'll just kind of set them loose. And so this was great. Another kind of deal where this company was uh, happy to make this technology available. You know, we paid for some expenses through the grant, uh, but really it's about, you know, them being involved in this project that is, you know, partially heritage based, partly trying to figure out what's happening with the environment here. So. Um, it's a good project to be involved in. And so we're always on the, on the lookout for folks that want to be part of it. And, and you know, people do want to work in a national marine sanctuary. And so we can leverage that. So this was, this was good. A lot of gremlins on that boat. We, um, you know, we got some data, but we, we want to try it again. It turns out probably for us that surface vehicle is a great force multiplier. So you bring your boat out that has a sonar in it. And then kind of, you know, like a mile away could be this autonomous platform. And so you're basically 
double dipping, I think probably a force multiplier. That's that's how that um, that autonomous system would work best. And then our third one was from the University of Delaware, and the idea was if you found something in deep water, you know, and you're like, okay, we got to scramble a dive team. That's going to take a while. You know, what could we use to go look at that target? And this is an underwater um, autonomous vehicle. The picture to the right there is a sonar image of the Gala Nipper, uh, which I showed earlier. And, um, you know, this was good. This is, you know, this technology has come so far. The graduate students running this, I mean, in, in, you know, 20 minutes, you can program a mission, throw this thing over the side, and a half hour it comes back with, with its data. You download that data right there on the, on the boat. Uh, you can tweak it a little bit, fly it a little closer. It's got two different frequencies of sonar. So, you know, kind of like a high resolution picture and a low resolution picture. So, you know, the upshot here is, you know, in an hour in a shipwreck over a shipwreck that's saying 200 feet, you really can dial in and get some, some great information and kind of plan your next steps of investigation. So this worked out really well. We we're pretty thrilled with that. And as I said, graduate students ran the whole thing. So there's this education component coming into the research component. I mean, I, you know, I, I hope we never have a sanctuary uh, research uh, effort that doesn't have more pieces and parts to it. You know, we just always want to try and glue these add-ons to the work we're doing to kind of uh, amplify its effect. So this was graduate students mostly running this technology, a couple of master students and a PhD student. So it's great to see these these students at work. These are the people that are going to go, you know, change the world and run million dollar ROVs in the Gulf of Mexico for oil and gas or, or do some incredible marine engineering. So it's pretty neat to have them to be part of it. And then just to kind of wrap up, we also had a day for educators. And again, the idea was the sanctuary is just getting off the ground. You know, could we bring some educators to the, to the dock here, to the riverside and show them the technology and just talk about ways that this technology might be able to be leveraged by them to, to you know, help the curriculum that they're teaching. And so that was great. We did a lot of networking and there's a ton of potential to, to work this kind of science into the classroom through the lens of the sanctuary. There's a million ways to do it, but you know, as you may all know, I mean, you can walk a couple blocks inland from, you know, any, any part of the Great Lakes and you'll find students who are, who are not aware of the Great Lakes, who certainly don't kind of understand the big role the Great Lakes play in, in all of our lives. Um, heritage is part of that, but, but certainly um, environmentally as well. And so there's just a, a real huge opportunity to do all we can to, to kind of make this message, you know, exciting, make it hands-on um, and try and you get the next generation of, of people excited about the Great Lakes because, you know, they're going to be the ones making decisions about it. And two quick short side, and then uh, that's all I got, um, efforts that we've got going on. We, you know, one of the things um, that was really key to the communities is, you know, how would a NOAA presence look on the lakeshore? You know, if we could build some facilities from, you know, marine operations or exhibits, you know, things that, you know, would be important to have for a marine sanctuary, what would that look like? Um, along the lakeshore. So right now we're doing a strategic plan, a facility plan. We've had a number of focus groups with the communities in the state and others. And the idea is to just sort of map out um, what it could look like if there were sanctuary resources to be um, deployed here and create infrastructure. How could we build on what's already there? How could we share space? What's the real important themes to hit? And then how do you create something kind of unique in each community that would then contribute to this bigger um, promotion of this entire region. So this is, we just started this, and so we're probably a year out from having this all sorted out, but you know, we're trying to take a strategic approach to figuring out what the NOAA presence might look like in these, in these communities. And to include folks outside of the box, to, you know, Chicago Maritime Museum included, um, you can see the Dennis Sullivan there and the Car Ferry Badger, you know, so, bringing something like the Dennis Sullivan in to do programming in the sanctuary in sort of a consistent, sustainable way. I mean, that's that's essentially a, kind of a roving education platform and, and visitor center. So um, we really want to think creative about things we can leverage and, and um, bring to the sanctuary. And then finally, um, in the next couple of months, we'll be putting out a recruitment announcement for our Sanctuary Advisory Council. 
And this is a 15 person council um, that helps inform the management of the marine sanctuary and also our liaisons to the communities. And that's equally, if not more important, these are the people that have a direct connection with the community. There's 15 seats and 15 alternates. Um, and the seats include economic development, archeology, span diving, recreation, uh, maritime industry, so that you know all those folks are at the table to, to know what's going on in the sanctuary, to you know, help inform its management, and to you know, be a liaison and ambassador to the community. So we're gonna get this announcement out over the, the next couple of, of months. And Jim, uh, Jerry, that's, that's all I've got. I'm gonna um, just kind of um, unshare my screen and um, thanks very much everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this stuff with you tonight. That was great, thanks a lot, Russ. And I encourage everyone to unmute yourself if you have a question to ask. And I think I'll start out the questions. One thing I've noticed around quite a few of the sanctuaries is that they include a lot of great communities, but they seem to almost purposely avoid larger metropolitan areas. Is that intentional? And if so, what's really the reason for that? No, not not at all. I, you know, at least here in the Great Lakes, um, you know, Thunder Bay was. Um, in a way community based, but also it was something that NOAA had been looking at for a while, but then 20 years passed or more before Wisconsin. Wisconsin was completely community based. Um, Lake Ontario, it's kind of centered around Oswego, so medium sized community, but no, any, any community can um, nominate a sanctuary. On the West Coast, you know, San Francisco is, is close to a sanctuary. Um, Savannah, Georgia, down in the Keys, you know, Key West, so there's nothing to, there's no rhyme or reason to why they end up where they end up other than the resource to be protected. Uh, Russ, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, what, what a wonderful talk and, and, and wonderful insight into what a sanctuary is. I had no idea. Um, one of the things that struck me in, in some of the things that you said is about artifacts. Could you say a little bit more? Because we're in the process of trying to build exhibits and some of which may be exhibits on underwater uh, uh, di um, dives or events. Uh, what do you need to tell? What, in terms of artifacts, what do you need to tell a story? Do you need a lot of artifacts, a few artifacts? How do you go about telling a story? Boy, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, it's a little bit for us. It's been a little bit opportunistic. It's kind of like what somebody donated or was, was you know, um, and Thunder Bay with the, that sanctuary has a visitor center and they house the uh, Michigan's uh, collection of state underwater or, or state artifacts from, from shipwreck sites. So, you know, that was kind of a ready-made thing and we did do some visible artifact storage and there it was really about putting everything on display with a very minimal amount of interpretation so people could just kind of absorb the variety of what's going on and you know we didn't always have the capacity to create a great exhibit and tell that story, but then the idea is to pull artifacts selectively out of there to tell individual stories. You know the Rouse Simmons is a great one. So I think it's partly driven by what artifacts you have, you know, maybe what shipwreck they came from, and how they fit into this maybe a broader story that a museum is is telling. You know, inevitably. Um, you know, people see a, a table of artifacts and they'll go to a certain one that they just really find appealing. You know, maybe it's an ice skate that was off the Niagara, maybe it's a, a pistol, or maybe it's like an ax, you know, and so being able to put them all on display, if you know, where possible, um, is a pretty interesting way to go. But I think it's a blend and kind of opportunistic. Um, but as a, as a, I don't know, as a society of people that are interested in this stuff, all of us, um, I think encouraging people that have artifacts to perhaps you know donate them to to a cultural institution is is a is a pretty good place to focus some of our energy. So we have an opportunity to tell those stories. Thank you. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the ice skates because we have roller skates off the wreck of the Iowa, and I always wondered should we really try to work <laughs> these into the exhibit to tell that human part of the story because. It's a pretty unexpected artifact from a shipwreck. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and I skate too. In fact, my daughter is roller skating right now, and she's we're in Sheboygan. She's at a roller. I didn't even know they still had roller rinks. So, I mean, 
they were roller skating back then when that uh, pair of skates was found and, and they still are. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. Very good. I encourage anyone else to unmute yourself if you like and join in the conversation. Hi, this is Tom from, uh, from Chicago area. Just kind of wondering, are there any uh, shipwreck sites that, I'm a non-diver, uh, but anything, uh, Russ, you mentioned maybe that could be, uh, could be seen or gotten to by, you know, canoe, kayak, or things like that? Yeah, you know, up, up our way off of uh, Raleigh Point, that's uh, Point Beach State Park in Two Rivers. Um, yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to do that. If you do that, give me a shout and I can I can help you because right now it's a little tough to find these places. So, you know, we do want to uh, put markers out there, have some shoreside signage so people know where to slide their paddleboard or kayak in. So, you know, up this way, it's it's definitely possible. Um, I don't know about the Chicago area, Jim. Is there are those opportunities down there, too? There's not as many, but uh, right in downtown Chicago, right by the planetarium. When the water level is a little bit lower than it is now, you can easily see the outline of a wreck that was probably repurposed as a break wall in the building of Northerly Island. So it's a nice place that anybody walking along the beach can see that. I, uh, Jim, uh, Sarah Thank Gilbert, you. I think, has her hand up. Yeah, there's um there's a shipwreck up in Evanston. I believe it's from, I don't know exactly what year. I used to teach sailing up at Northwestern. And we would kind of free dive. It's in between like Greenwood and Dempster, and it's less than a mile offshore. Um, and it's not very deep, but I know there was a fire and a lot of people perished. And I've actually sort of dug around in this the sand by the rocks and found little shards of stuff. Um, so there is there is some shipwrecks up in Evanston, sort of just um south of lighthouse beach basically in between like like in between like dempster greenwood and you know clark street beach that area the one you're talking about that's the george morley and that's, it, yeah you, you can swim to it from shore to dive on it but it's a long swim from shore so <laughs> better take a boat uh, yeah. tough. <laughs> i've got a question oh yeah craig yeah. Hey, um, when I was back a uh, student uh, at New Trier back in the uh, late 60s and stuff, we all started scuba diving and we went off on that wreck and uh, off Evanston, but also went up to Door County to on the rocks and dove in those wrecks up there. And I see I see you have collection of artifacts from the wrecks, but we were always told you leave all that stuff on the wrecks. Are there are, are there laws that that tell you to leave the stuff there or do you want people to take them off? Yeah, no, you got to leave, you got to leave it. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. So there is a, like a federal law in uh, 1987, the Abandoned Shipwreck Act, it conferred ownership of abandoned wrecks to the states. And so really, you know, any abandoned shipwreck out there is, is owned by its respective state, particularly in the Great Lakes, because it's all state water. So, and these states have regulations, of course, the sanctuary has regulations prohibiting removing artifacts or even moving stuff around. And that's just so that Everybody that comes behind you can enjoy it. And, you know, it's a pretty simple um, premise. So, yeah, but in the 70s, you know, the advent of scuba, 60s, 70s, you know, I think it was, um, it was adventure. It wasn't highly regulated. You know, probably every state had some kind of antiquities statute that probably prohibited. But, you know, I, I, I look at it as, uh, you know, an opportunity that 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 happened and that those were taken and it's two messages it's one you know let's let's do something with all those artifacts that are already brought up but going forward you know that that's not something we do because you know the stuff is so well preserved in the great lakes so it's it's illegal to do that and in, you know but there's stuff that's up in garages and basements that we I mean we probably should take care of yeah that's thanks, a good question for, thanks for clarifying it and that one wreck off of uh evanston uh Remember in the 70s, a group of, of local divers from the North Shore, they went out and they cut the propeller off that thing. Pretty good, good you know, eight or nine, 10 foot diameter propeller. They brought it on shore and kind of made a, uh, uh, you know, uh, not a memorial, but, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, statue uh, with the wreck out there. But then they made them put the, take the prop back out there and put it next to the wreck, you know, so. Oh, God. Yeah. That's a good way to deal with those big artifacts. You know, it's funny, like the wreck hunters that I've gotten to know, 
you know, in a way they were bringing stuff up. Um, you know, so the one in Port Washington started a maritime museum. You know, is that their way of sharing the stuff with the public in, in a large part too, which I think is, is you know, important to, to mention. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? Uh, in the meantime, Russ, I'll ask you a question about one of the photos you showed. It was uh, credited to Jody Hensler and it was taken from a paddleboard and you could see a engine in shallow water and that engine had a flywheel on it. And that's kind of unusual for Great Lakes steam engines. And we've been puzzled by one off Chicago that's a tugboat-ish boat, but it's got a flywheel on the engine. We're still trying to decipher just what all it is. Do you know the photo I'm referring to and do you know what the vessel was? I do, yeah, that's uh, the wreck of the Continental, which is one of those shallow wrecks that I mentioned. That one usually has pretty good viz. Um, it, you know, that engine is proud of the bottom. Some years it's sticking above the water, but there was a master's thesis done on that, Jim. I'll send it to you. Oh, great. Um, yeah, talks a lot about it. That's, um, Jim, you are the only person that has ever commented on that image and pointed out there was a flywheel on there. <laughs> well, there there's well a bunch of us on here tonight that have been diving on this track <laughs> that have been scratching our head over why is this engine the way it is on this wreck? So it's uh, it's been a fun mystery that uh, it's not solved yet down here. So yeah, I'll be looking forward to that report. Okay, cool. Anyone else want to jump in? Scott, you always have questions. Usually, but I couldn't think of any good ones that were relevant. <laughs> I always have lots of questions, but I try to keep the questions I actually ask relevant now, unlike my uh, youth. <laughs> What's the fun in there? Rush, I really appreciate appreciate you uh, doing the presentation. That is great. Where are you? Can I ask where you're living now or planning to live? We're in Sheboygan. Yeah. Sheboygan. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we got the the sanctuary. I, I'm like the sole sanctuary employee. We got an office in on the campus, uh, University of Green Bay, Sheboygan. Oh, cool. So yeah, it's right in the middle. You can get to both ends of the sanctuary from here. Very good. Bill Maxwell, you want to jump in? Yeah, I have a question. Um, the zebra mussels now that are clearing up the, the, the waters a little bit, but what's going to happen to these wrecks here in 20 years with, with the mussels on there? Are they doing any damage other than just encasing them? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, from my knowledge, you know, there there's some potential for when they are on a metal shipwreck, you know, there's kind of a little microclimate going on there between the muscle and the wreck. I guess there's, that's a, probably to be studied. I think that, I think their weight is, is a big deal. Uh, Wait, particularly if you got a carbon shipwreck. Dioxide. Carbon dioxide causes acidification, acidification of the water, which accelerates the. Uh, yeah, so that, I mean, that could be a, a big problem for a big iron wreck, um, you know, um, the, the where we've seen them probably do the most damage is just weight. You know, if you got a shallow water shipwreck, it's already dynamic. You've got a few timbers; it's not real well articulated, and you've just got a mass of zebra mussels that, you know, they sink, you know, data buoys all all the time. So, to to be studied, I, you know, it's a funny thing. One of the problems that I've seen with them is that you know people will go to a really uh, key, key part of a wreck, you know, there's a name board on a couple of wrecks, this is my dog, sorry, and um, in Thunder Bay, and it's a beautiful name board, and the discoverer of that wreck, found in 2003, it's in about 180 feet of water, so there were no quagga mussels there yet, and it's just clear as day. Of course, three or four years later, it's covered with quagga mussels, and now divers are brushing it off, you know, to get a photo opportunity, so, and it has definitely changed that carved relief, and so, you know, that's, I think, a small but pretty impactful way that zebra mussels are kind of indirectly hurting shipwrecks. Well, because how they attach to it, they have the sticky little fibers. And so they come off, a little piece of the shipwreck comes off with them. Yeah, there's really some harebrained ideas of what you could do. I mean, because they do really mess up the archaeological surfaces, right? So, but you could, if you had a, a, a shipwreck or part of a shipwreck you thought was important, you could, you could, Put a tarp around it and starve them, and they they will eventually kind of fall out. There are um, I forget the actual scientific name for these, but there is an a muscle aside essentially that that people are using that stays local to that kind of surface area that you're working near. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I think uh, big power companies know a lot more about this th than we do because they've got a they've got to deal with this stuff, and 
I don't know if anybody knows if they're still just scraping them off the intake or if somebody's come up with a better idea. I've heard the black a back flush with chlorine and things like that, but you only can do that to a certain extent without getting in trouble. You know? right. <laughs> EPA. Yep. So as of now, what percentage of those muscles are quagga and what percentage are zebra? Do we know that now? I know it's switching supposedly dramatically. Quagga could actually uh, set up home on sand. Zebra can't. So they're much more op opportunistic. Yeah, I think the, the high percentage of quagga muscles, you know, and um, there's a couple of reports by the Great Lakes uh, Environmental Research Lab that's got a couple of graphics of the last, you know, 10 years or so. And I think they're, if not all have switched now, but they're predominantly quagga muscles. Yep. Now I know it's also, really, I've been not, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I've been diving since 94. So I started diving right before the muscles started cleaning up the water. So I saw it go real clear. Now I'm seeing it go a little more cloudy, which I'm not saying is it necessarily a bad thing, but it's the turbidity is going back up a little bit. I don't know if that's been noted by anyone, but it appears to be. Yeah, not, not that I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, one thing about the, the muscles though, you know, when we were diving in Thunder Bay and wrecks that are in 200 feet of water or so in 2004, 2005, you could, you could see just small one one or two quagga mussels but the water column was crystal clear because all the zebra mussels in the higher part of the water column were filter feeding so and then all of a sudden like four years later it slammed shut and they and those deeper wrecks were covered with quagga mussels so there is sort of a, a cautionary tale or at least you know a reason why we should monitor these places to figure out who knows what the next challenge is and i guess my point is that if we had known that door was going to slam on these deeper shipwrecks, I mean, would, you know, if we could have, would we have directed a lot more resources and attention to include citizen science, right? If you're a tech diver and you're heading out there to this, you know, these pristine wrecks, we know that the door is going to slam on these things. So, you know, photos, videos, and that thing. I mean, we could have probably done some things with a little bit of foresight, but, you know, who could foresee that coming? And these are limited resources, too, because they do deteriorate. I mean, because of the muscles yep. that are deteriorating faster than maybe they would have otherwise, but they do naturally deteriorate. Uh, yep. On the Milwaukee, I know I've seen significant changes in just 20, the 20 years I've been diving it. Yep, they won't, won't be here forever. So I guess what I'm saying, enjoy it and also document while it's here. I mean, obviously respect it, but also document it. We're gonna get you diving up in the sanctuary. Have you done, have you done a lot of diving up here, Scott? Uh, not a lot. I don't really make a whole lot of time. I should make more time. I, I'm not a tech diver yet, so I don't really go deeper than 165. But yeah, there's a lot of neat stuff to see. I do some underwater photography. I, I have a mid-range camera system. That's great. There's a new dive shop in Sheboygan, so if you get the bug, what's its up. name? Just so. uh, well, that's a good question. They they haven't even opened yet. I'm not sure what they're. Okay, don't worry call about it. So. Then. I didn't know. I, yeah. I know yeah, you have the you'll Lottie Cooper up there too, don't you? Yeah, right. You don't even have to dive. Yep. Yeah, we actually, uh, the WUA did a, a workshop up there a couple of years ago online. Okay. We did a survey workshop. All so right. you see why Jim asked me to start talking because I don't shut up when <laughs> I start talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's eight o'clock. Uh, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. Uh, last chance for everyone to jump in with any questions. But otherwise, Russ, we really want to thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. for taking the time and Tell us about this, and we're looking forward to seeing how things develop up there. And especially if we can find some way to work on any joint projects, we'd love to make that happen. Sounds good. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. Seeing no more hands, uh, I'm gonna say good night to everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks again to Russ. Uh, like I said, keep uh, the upcoming third Fridays on your calendar, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, there are a lot of new exhibits opening at the museum, so if you haven't been there in a while, please come back. Uh, always new stuff to see. So looking forward to that. Uh, hope to have a great summer at the museum with all you visiting. So thanks again, Russ. Great. And uh, thank, thank you, Russ. Everyone, you bet. Have a good night, guys. Night. Thank night. you.